In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. From the mount of his famous sermon, our Lord came down to Capernaum. And there he encountered the good centurion. Now this centurion was a Gentile, a commander in the Roman army. But this Gentile military leader had learned to love Israel and her God. We learn from St. Luke's Gospel that this man had even demonstrated his love for Israel by building them a synagogue. What we see in the good centurion then is a representation of the end of Judaism as the Jews of that time had known it. God's people would no longer be almost exclusively limited to a single ethnicity. Times were changing. It's not merely that Israel was occupied by a foreign army, but also that the center of God's people was now shifting away from Jerusalem, away from that temple built with hands, away from Palestine, to him who lays down his life and takes it up again, to him who is a house of prayer for all people in the fullest sense of that term. And so the old boundaries of the law, that is the boundaries of the old temple, the boundaries between Jew and Gentile, between men and women, between priests and laity, all the old boundaries of the law are now being dissolved in the person of Jesus Christ. And so our Lord says that this good centurion will receive due reward at the proper time. When his pilgrimage on earth is ended, the good centurion will receive his eternal reward and rest at the table of eternal feasting. But note that he goes not to this feast with war heroes and powerful pagans surrounding him, men like Alexander the Great, Scipio Africanus, or Julius Caesar. No, his reward is to feast with the heroes of the Christian faith. He goes to feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These men are now his kin. He calls Abraham father because he is a child who has been raised up from a stone. Now, in contrast, are those who will not receive eternal reward and rest at the table of eternal feasting. Such people are those who had only an outward connection with Abraham and would soon discover that that outward connection was not enough. See, the distinctive thing about Abraham was not his curly hair or his great learning, nor was it the outward circumcision. No, the distinctive thing about Abraham was his faith. He hoped and waited for the grace of God in the Messiah, for the forgiveness of sins and for reconciliation to the Father. And so to be a son of Abraham then is to be circumcised in the heart, to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. And so those who thought that they were sons of the kingdom by right were wrong. No one, including the good centurion, is fit or worthy of the Lord's kingdom. The kingdom is bestowed by grace upon the undeserving, or else it is not bestowed at all. And so those who think that they come by right, whether that is because they were baptized in the Missouri Synod, because they served the church with all their heart, or because their mother was Jewish, those who think that they come to the kingdom by right will be cast out into the outer darkness. And in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, weeping, of course, comes from sorrow. But gnashing of teeth, note that gnashing of teeth is, is not due to anguish or physical torture, as we often associate with hell. But gnashing of teeth is associated with anger and rage. And so those who find themselves in the place of gnashing of teeth are those who wanted to go their own way on this earth, those who wanted to be their own lords. They insisted that they be judged and handled according to their own history and righteousness, and 
so they will be. They will be given over precisely to what they desired, and they shall spend eternity in their own sin and in darkness. Those who cling to their own pride and anger will spend eternity in sorrow and in frustrated, debilitating anger, in weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so this shows us just how terrible anger is. In hell, men are given over to their anger. There is nothing and no one to mediate them from themselves. There is no law, only wrath, and they are alone. Now, in our culture today, anger is probably one of the most acceptable sins. We give in to it all too easily because it has this vain air of strength about it. So we take pride in our angry responses of vengeance toward others if we deem that they deserved it, such as when we respond to a hateful comment in kind or when we secretly try to get back at someone for something that they did to us. However, these angry actions are in direct contradiction to our Lord's command that we love our enemies. But of course, it makes us feel good for a brief moment to pound our chests and strut about and talk about vengeance, except, of course, we probably don't use the word vengeance. But vengeance, even when we call it justice, it's still what we want. But vengeance is mine saith the Lord. And that means that vengeance is not yours. And if you take by force what is the Lord's, then you will be damned. Now, we mostly recognize a man who is overcome by drunkenness or lust as a slave to those things. But we mistakenly think that the wrathful or angry man is strong. He is not. He is just as much a slave as the others, and maybe worse, because his sin is more directly tied to pride. All sinful anger is tinged with more than a little self-righteousness, as though the injustices and slights that you've suffered were cosmically significant, and the whole universe ought to stop on your behalf. How dare someone cut in front of you in traffic. Don't they know how important you are? How dare someone be rude to you of all people in the grocery store? And so we continually demonstrate our slavery to anger. The Holy Spirit, however, does not move us to anger, but rather he moves us to pity. The Lord describes hell as being full of people who whose pride led them to think that God owes them something because they belonged to the right club or knew the right words to say. Our Lord describes hell as a place where people will gnash their teeth and make themselves angry without relief. Here's the point. Giving in to anger and being angry is to bring upon yourself a little bit of hell on earth now. We must stop. Repent. Let it go. Turn. To give in to anger is to gnash your teeth against God, to insist on your own way, to demand your own vengeance. When you do so, you only hurt yourself and those whom you love. Your anger is weak and unhealthy, and most importantly, it is dangerous to the health of your soul. Repent. Consider the good centurion. He is strong, but his strength is in virtue. He is strong in faith, hope, and love, along with patience, humility, and wisdom. What happens to the good centurion's servant physically is an illustration of what had 
already happened to the good centurion spiritually. The Lord worked physical healing and life in the servant from afar by his word. And of course, he had done the same spiritually for the good centurion. See, the centurion was unfit in a Levitical sense and unworthy in a moral sense. But the Lord still healed his soul with his word. And as he did so, he gave him not a new place and not new things. The Lord gave him the place that is bestowed by grace through faith upon all those who trust in Christ. The Lord gave to him a place at the table of eternal feasting with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That is to say, he gave to him a place in the kingdom of God. The centurion is healed, reconciled and loved by God. It's no wonder then that this centurion's prayer has been taken up by the church as the traditional prayer before receiving the body of Christ in the Lord's Supper. We are not worthy or fit that Christ enter into us. We are morally impure because we are slaves to sin. We are ceremonially unclean because we are distracted, lacking proper fasts and discipline. We are unprepared. But still, the Lord says to you, take, eat, this is my body. And so we do, at his, at his command, as men under authority. And our souls are healed, not from afar, But our souls are healed from near, by his word, joined to the bread to be his body for us. Thus we are joined to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He enters into us and gives us a place at the table of eternal feasting with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by faith. And makes us partakers, temples even, of the kingdom and the spirits and the Christ. So, my friends, this is the real miracle in Capernaum. Yes, the centurion and his servant are healed, but that's not the chief miracle. And the chief miracle isn't even the centurion's faith, which our Lord marvels at. The chief miracle is Christ himself. Christ himself, his grace, his undeserved love, his mercy. Christ himself is the miracle. He is the kingdom. He is the hope of Israel. He is the savior of Gentiles like you and me. He is the giver of faith and the creator of Christians. He makes us brothers, daughters, and brides. He grants us all a place at that table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Thanks be to God that such a gift is ours. In Jesus' name, amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.